Good afternoon. I'm Emma Dent, I'm Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Harvard Horizons 2019. In just a few minutes, I'll be introducing you to our seventh class of eight Harvard Horizons scholars. They've been selected in fierce competition from the 57 programs that the Graduate School proudly oversees across the entire university. Each scholar will perform a sort of tightrope walk. They'll have just five minutes to share with us their own highly original cutting edge research in language that all of us can understand no matter what our discipline is. And they'll make it look easy. <laughs> but before we meet them, it's my enormous pleasure to invite a very special Graduate School of Arts and Sciences alumnus from our PhD program in public policy onto the stage to say a few words. If you haven't guessed already, it's President Larry Bacow. Thank you very much, and, and let me just begin by saying congratulations to our Harvard Horizon Scholars. I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been invited up on this stage as a graduate student to do what you are about to do, to walk the proverbial tightrope. Um, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, I was reflecting a little bit. The very first time I spoke on this stage as, as president of Harvard, it was to welcome new graduate students in GSAS um, uh, here. And I'm happy to be back today and to celebrate the achievements of some of their fellow graduate students. Um, students, and I think, let's be honest, they all aspire to be like you guys, uh, to someday uh, be up here. Uh, my predecessor, Nathan, Nathan Pusey, one of my predecessors, himself the recipient of both um, an AB, an MA, and a PhD from Harvard, memorably described the university as, and I'd like to quote him and quote him precisely, a kind of island of light in a very widespread darkness. This is me speaking again. But not an island completely removed from the um, interests of society. Far from it. Universities never are. Um, but again, what distinguished Harvard, in his words, was the opportunity to, and again I quote, for the intellectual activity to come into sharper focus and so become richer, more vivid, more convincing, and more captivating than in society at large, end quote. Today we will enjoy an especially bright spot on our illuminated island. Ideas from across the humanities and the social sciences and the applied sciences and engineering will be communicated to us clearly, concisely, precisely, and I suspect with great enthusiasm. The excellence of our graduate students will be brought into sharper focus and our knowledge of their research and appreciation for their, their talents will expand and improve. Graduate students are special for many, many reasons, not the least of which, together working with their faculty advisors, you all push the boundaries of knowledge. You help create the scholarship that will inform the teaching of future scholars. You help to establish the relationship between student and faculty. You help to establish the scholarly reputation that is, in fact, Harvard. We are enormously proud of each and every one of you. And I think what we are all privileged to see here today is but a mere preview of coming attractions of what we can expect from these remarkable students who I, I sincerely believe will someday change the world. So there's no be better way to illuminate the meaning and value of our work than for me to sit down 
and for you to hear from our scholars. Thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to be part of this. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Larry. And now it's time to meet our eight 2019 Harvard Horizon Scholars and to hear their fields. So, Harvard Horizons 2019 rise. <laughs> we have Victoria Huang, Applied Physics, Matteo Harkin, History, Caitlin Nichols, Division of Medical Sciences, Biological and Biomedical Sciences, Alexandra Schultz, The Classics, Mateus Fernandez, Applied Mathematics, Schwang Frost, Anthropology, Jess Canwell, Division of Medical Sciences, Neuroscience, and Daniel Walden, Music. Now we're going to hear the presentations. Enjoy. For billions of years, nature has filled the world with colors. But have you ever wondered, where does color come from? How does it work? Well, it turns out that nature uses two main ways to make colors, and both of them are used by birds. Let me show you how. Red birds use pigments, and blue birds use structures inside their feathers. If we do an experiment and we grind down the feathers of the red bird into a fine powder, it will look red, just like we would expect. But if we do the same with blue feathers, the color disappears. And that tells us that the material in the blue feathers isn't actually blue. So what's going on? Well, red birds have molecular pigments or absorbers in their feathers that absorb the blue and green colors. So the material of the feather is red. This is the same as the pigments in your clothes, for example. But bluebirds don't have these pigments, so the green and red colors simply pass through the material. And the structure inside the feather reflects only the blue back to our eyes. When we destroy the structure by grinding it into a fine powder, we also destroy the color. I'm an applied physicist, and when I learned about structural colors, I loved it. And I also fell in love with birds, as you can tell from my dress. <laughs> because you might think that colors are simple, but actually, there's so much physics behind. The physics of light and colors and how it interacts with structure. So how does light interact with structure to make colors? Let's look at an example, a blue Katinga bird feather. The internal structure of the feather is made up of a packing of small spheres, about one hundredth the width of a hair. And when researchers mimicked this structure using nanoparticles, they got the same color as the bird. In a simplified picture, this structure reflects only the colors or wavelengths that are similar in size to the nanoparticles, and all other colors simply pass through. Now, if we make these nanoparticles larger, then these longer wavelengths can now fit in the structure and reflect back. This is the basic physical mechanism behind structural color. The color comes from the structure and not from the material itself. However, to make structural colors for applications, 
we cannot just simply rely on mimicking structures from nature because the structures that we see in nature are often much more complex because birds, for example, have other requirements like they must be light enough to be able to fly. But we don't have these requirements, so could we design structural colors using simpler structures instead? To answer this question, I embarked on a research journey three years ago, and along with collaborators in Professor Manoharan's lab, I developed a computer model that predicts the color from a structure. Here's how it works. We have our simple model, our simple structure, and we model light using solutions to Maxwell's equations. We actually model light in the form of photons, which travel through the material, getting scattered along the way until they exit either by passing through it or reflecting back. At each step, the photon decides how long the next step will be and in what direction, based on probabilities derived from scattering theory. These probabilities depend on the sample parameters, like the material of the nanoparticles and the medium, the packing density and the size of the nanoparticles, and the thickness of the material. I also derived the effects of other parameters, like the variability in the size of the nanoparticles, the presence of absorption, since many times birds use a combination of pigments and structures, and the effect of surface roughness. By physically capturing the features of real life samples, I was able to achieve, for the first time, quantitative agreement between experimental data and model. And this is important because it means that we can predict the exact color from a structure, and we can do it fast. We can use our model to understand what parameters control structural colors and venture in a field that has been inaccessible to us until now, the precise control and design of structural colors for applications without having to rely on mimicking structures from nature and using simpler structures instead. So what's next? Well, structural colors have unique properties that pigments don't have, which make them more versatile. For example, structural colors are tunable. Because the color comes from the structure and not from the material itself, we can make different colors by just changing the structure using the same material. This is exciting for applications like making sensors or electronic displays, like a paper white Kindle, but colored. Also, structural colors can be safe. We can design structural colors using safe and environmentally friendly materials. But our model is not limited to just colors. It's really a model of light. We can design coatings that protect against UV radiation or smart windows for more heat efficient and sustainable buildings. And lastly, our model can help us understand nature. As I said earlier, red birds use pigments. And to our knowledge, there are no examples in nature of a homogeneous structural red. So then our model can help us understand why that is the case, and if it is at all possible to make a homogeneous structural red. Our goal is to use our model to not just mimic the structural colors we see in nature, but maybe go one step further and make colors that not even nature has been able to make. Thank you. So, you say you want a revolution. Well, I'm a historian, and my scholarship asks how 20th century revolutions in the global south have shaped the world we live in today. Now, 
In order to understand why I study this, first, you have to meet my grandfather. He's my hero. I keep his portrait on my desk, actually. And I'm not alone. Pedro Joaquin Chamorro is a hero to many people in my home country of Nicaragua, where he's a symbol of civil liberties and resistance to tyranny. Unfortunately, I never got to meet him. Throughout his life, he was a civic leader and journalist who opposed the dynastic dictatorship of Nicaragua's Somoza family. And about 40 years ago, he paid the ultimate price for his struggle. Looking back, scholars widely cite his assassination as a turning point. Popular indignation helped bring about the overthrow of the Somoza regime and helped bring about the Sandinista Revolution, the last major socialist project of the 20th century. One which you probably remember because in the 1980s, a Sandinista obsession gripped the United States with Oliver North and Iran-Contra dominating the airwaves as the Reagan administration sought to roll back leftist revolutions in Central America. Back then, my country became a sort of abstraction, whereupon U.S. citizens could debate their country's foreign policy or confirm their ideological priors about socialism and national liberation movements. When the revolution ended in 1990, after a ruinous civil war, Nicaragua lost its salience for those debates, and therefore, the obsession ended. But for me, the armed conflicts of the 1980s weren't abstract. They were real. In fact, in a microcosm of what happened at the national level, my family, brought together by my grandfather's passing, was torn apart by the revolution, as some, including my parents, joined the Sandinistas' revolutionary government, whereas others chose to help lead the U.S.-backed opposition. They were literally brothers caught on opposite sides of a civil war. And so I grew up asking, why had there been a revolution in my country? And I grew up wondering if all that violence and sacrifice had been worth it. Those are the questions which brought me here today. My dissertation is the first academic history of the Nicaraguan Revolution truly told on Nicaraguan terms. That meant probing archives from the Sandinistas' revolutionary government. And in order to write this history, I had to speak with the people who made history. I conducted interviews with guerrilla leaders, diplomats, and heads of state from around the region. But this wasn't easy. At first, I worried that this story was too personal, too messy. How could I be a dispassionate, objective observer? Moreover, as somebody who comes from a privileged sector of Nicaraguan society, I was wary of the old maxim that the winners write history. But the more time passed, the more I realized that my passion was an important reason for studying this, and that, if anything, my privilege gave me a certain responsibility to do so. And what my research argues is that leftist revolutions in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua where the rebels actually won, inadvertently propelled Central America's transition to democracy. It wasn't pretty. Some 300,000 people died in Central America in the 1970s and 80s as anti-communist dictators repressed calls for social change. Socialist rebels emerged in response, leading to further repression, further revolution, and a violent spiral. Intervention from the United States added fuel to the fire, but failed to reverse leftist revolutions. And out of that bloody stalemate emerged democracy as a compromise. Central American leaders realized 
that in order to create stability within their societies, and in order to prevent foreign powers from violently intervening in their affairs, they had to create inclusive political systems where all actors could participate. Now, in telling that story, I'm helping break down some walls in our conventional understanding of history and politics. So first, I'm rethinking revolutions. Rather than just asking what happened inside Nicaragua, I explore revolutionary and counter-revolutionary connections across borders. For one, only a transnational perspective could explain how an otherwise little-known country whose GDP amounts to about a third of this university's endowment could animate such passionate responses around the world. Second, I'm complicating the Cold War. In most of the world, the Cold War was actually hot. That's because it wasn't just a geopolitical conflict between the USA and the USSR. In fact, it was an ideological struggle between capitalist and communist worldviews, one which played out primarily in the so-called third world. 99% of war-induced casualties in the late 20th century took place in the global south which leads to my third and final point, that I'm decentering democratization. Today, scholars are transfixed by the concern that democracy may be in decline, both here and around the world. What my research does is expose the contradictory ways in which liberal democracy spread to much of the world in the first place. In Central America, democratization came about in reaction to unique circumstances created by the Cold War. Basically, in much of the Global South, people came to see elections as tools which they could use to defuse the civil wars and foreign interventions which had ravaged their countries as a result of the global struggle between capitalism and communism. And it worked. In making politics, people traded bullets for ballots. However, democratization was not designed as a cure for the world's other illnesses. Poor economic growth, gaping inequalities, weak institutions. When you look at the Cold War origins of democratization and you look at that view from the South, it becomes easier to understand the apparent malaise of global democratic institutions around the world today. In other words, Democracy didn't just spread magically southwards from Europe and the United States, nor was it the end of history. Rather, it was a pragmatic solution to the challenges of the day. Indeed, in another microcosm, my family came together at the end of the 1980s, setting aside their ideological differences, abandoning the simple black and white worldviews of the Cold War in exchange for a complicated but peaceful coexistence. These then are the stakes of my research. Of course, I would love to ignite a scholarly debate about the place of revolutions in the history of democracy. But I'd also like to do for my country, Nicaragua, what I've done for myself. Study our history in order to reckon with the complicated legacies of our recent past. Thank you for your time. Over the last 50 years, we have made remarkable progress in understanding the causes of cancer and ways that we might treat it. Yet for those of us whose lives have been touched by the disease, it's clear that we need more effective treatments. One cancer treatment many of us have heard of is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy kills rapidly dividing tumor cells, but it damages other tissues as well, causing devastating side effects for patients. A newer, more sophisticated form of cancer therapy is known as targeted therapy. As its name suggests, Targeted therapy is designed to attack cancer cells specifically, while leaving normal tissue unaffected. 
Targeted therapy represents the future of cancer treatment, but it's yet to live up to its potential promise. Of the over 600,000 people in the US with metastatic cancer last year, only nine in 100 were even eligible for a targeted therapy. And of these, only five derived any benefit from the drug. With all the knowledge we have gained about cancer, why is it that we still have so few effective targeted therapies? One of the reasons lies in the fact that many efforts at making new targeted therapies are directed at malfunctioning cancer genes that cause tumor cells to grow and divide out of control. However, cancer genes account for only 2% of all the genes in a human cell, and many of them are what we refer to as undruggable. It's proven nearly impossible to make new therapies that can target them effectively. Now, this strategy of targeting malfunctioning cancer genes makes sense because these are the genes that caused the tumor in the first place. But as a cancer biologist, I wondered if we might be missing something by focusing only on these most obvious genes. What if we could kill cancer cells by targeting other genes instead? In my research, I've characterized a novel class of over 5,000 potential cancer targets that may enable us to do just that. The class of genes I focused on is known as essential genes. In contrast to malfunctioning cancer genes, which cause tumor cells to grow and divide out of control, essential genes perform basic functions that allow cells to survive, such as generating energy and eliminating waste. While malfunctioning cancer genes are present only in tumor cells, essential genes are present in both tumor and normal cells and they're required by all of these cells to survive. But you may wonder, if essential genes are required in both tumor and normal cells, how is it that we could use them to target cancer cells specifically? Every healthy cell in your body contains two copies of each essential gene, one from your mom and one from your dad. These two gene copies perform the same essential function but they can differ slightly in their DNA sequence. They're basically different versions of the same essential gene. While cells have two copies of each essential gene, they usually only need one to survive. And this can be observed in cancer cells, which frequently have lost large portions of their DNA. Sometimes one version of an essential gene, in this case, the orange version, is lost from the tumor entirely while the other version, in this case the blue version, remains intact. This leaves the cancer cell vulnerable. It can survive as long as it has this remaining essential gene version, but if it loses that version, it will die. If we could create a drug that would target only the version of the essential gene left in the cancer cells, while leaving the other version unaffected, we would expect that the cancer cells would die while the normal cells should be able to survive using their backup essential gene version. In this way, I hypothesized that we may be able to use essential genes rather than malfunctioning cancer genes as a new strategy for making targeted therapies. I refer to this class of potential cancer targets as Gemini vulnerabilities, after the twins from classical mythology, Castor and Pollux. Like our two gene versions, Castor and Pollux were nearly identical, except Pollux was immortal, like the version of the gene that should resist the drug and save the normal cells, while Castor was mortal, like the version of the gene we'd like to target with the drug to kill the tumor cells. To test this idea, I picked essential genes that had two different versions and started with cells that either had both versions or that had lost one. Using gene editing technology, I inactivated the only version of the essential gene left in the cancer cells while leaving the other version intact. When I did this, as expected, the healthy cells were able to survive using their backup essential gene version. 
However, the tumor cells, which had lost their only remaining gene version, died. This result was exciting because it confirmed that we could, in fact, target cancer cells specifically using different versions of essential genes. In this way, exploiting Gemini vulnerabilities may represent a new strategy for developing targeted therapeutics. Now, the idea of targeting Gemini vulnerabilities has been around since the 1990s. However, the technology necessary to fully explore this target class has been developed only recently. To identify Gemini vulnerabilities on a large scale, I analyzed cutting edge datasets generated by our collaborators. These datasets represent the largest of their kind ever created. They included gene version data from over 60,000 people, essential gene data from over 500 laboratory tumors, and gene loss data from nearly 10,000 patient cancer samples. My analysis of these data found over 5,000 potential Gemini vulnerabilities, providing many opportunities for us to find one that could lead to an effective therapeutic. Additionally, my analysis found that a drug targeting the typical Gemini vulnerability could benefit over 18,000 patients per year in the US alone, underscoring the potential impact of this new target strategy for cancer patients and their families. So now that I've shown that we can use Gemini vulnerabilities to target cancer cells specifically, and have identified over 5,000 opportunities to do so, where do we go from here? So far, I've begun to prioritize these candidates for future development, and we're already moving forward with some of the most promising hits. There remains much work to be done before a drug targeting any Gemini vulnerability could reach the cancer clinic. Nonetheless, it's my hope that this work will provide a valuable resource for the cancer research community as we work together to find better treatments for patients. Thank you. How many of you have heard of the Library of Alexandria? For a library founded over 2,000 years ago, you hear about it a surprising amount today. For many of us, libraries are places of learning, research, and social spaces. But libraries are also powerful symbols of knowledge and authority, and models we use to preserve information and send it on to the future. For example, as curious as it may sound, the Library of Alexandria is a model for information technology today. Wikipedia, Google Books, and the Internet Archive have all been compared to the library for their attempts to collect all of human knowledge and store it in one place. And how many of you knew that Amazon's Alexa is named after the Alexandrian Library? Why is one of the oldest libraries in history such a powerful symbol today? I work on ancient libraries from an exciting period of Greek history called the Hellenistic period, from 323 to 31 BC. During this period, a new type of library emerged. You see, archives and libraries have existed for over 5,000 years, since the third millennium BC, Archaeologists have uncovered collections of cuneiform tablets from ancient Mesopotamia, papyri from ancient Egypt, and Linear B tablets from ancient Greece. Kings, priests, scribes, and more depended on these archives and libraries to govern and do their jobs. But it's unlikely that most other people even knew these collections existed. However, during the Hellenistic period, a new type of book collection emerged. As opposed to the private archives and libraries that had existed for millennia, these new libraries were large and public-facing, 
located in major cities, mostly clustered around the Eastern Mediterranean, but found as far west as Italy and as far east as modern-day Afghanistan. At the end of the Hellenistic period, politicians started building monumental libraries whose facades towered over the ordinary citizens walking beneath them every day. How did this shift from private to monumental libraries take place? Well, since antiquity, the story has been that the first monumental library was a library of Alexandria, founded in Egypt around 300 BC by a great king, Ptolemy I, one of Alexander the Great's successors. Supposedly, the library contained hundreds of thousands of books. In fact, every single book ever written. And it became the model for all other Hellenistic libraries. Most modern scholars recognize that the story is exaggerated, but they still believe that the Library of Alexandria was the original monumental library. This ancient story has become history. But in the last decade, a few scholars have started to question whether it's really true. They've pointed out that the narrative is full of historical inaccuracies and inconsistencies. More disturbingly, as I got deeper into my own research, I found that this story dates from later than some of our evidence for other libraries. Evidence like a marble plaque listing donors who founded a library on the Greek island of Kos. A catalog of authors painted on the wall of a library in Sicily. And traces of ink left behind on the floor of a treasury in Afghanistan where a book had once fallen to the ground. I started to think, what if the Library of Alexandria wasn't the first library? What if something more complicated had taken place? What if this story was just a myth? In that case, how did they go from private to monumental libraries? And why wasn't anyone writing that history? Where did this fantasy about the Library of Alexandria come from? And why was it so powerful? These are the questions I answer in my research. First, by studying material evidence, I look at how libraries developed as institutions in the Greco-Roman world. Rather than being the invention of a single person at a single place at a single time, the development of libraries was a slow, gradual process that took place throughout the Mediterranean and Near East. It depended on many different factors, changes in education, book culture, and the ways aristocrats invested money in local communities. But what lay underneath all of these changes were attitudes towards Greece. Greek literature was prestigious, and libraries allowed people to harness this prestige for cultural capital. I then go back to stories about libraries, especially the Library of Alexandria, to try to understand where these fantasies about libraries came from. I found that in these stories, libraries act as powerful metaphors for empires. There are two motifs where this is especially clear. The first is the motif of the universal library, the library with every book in the world. Although libraries, like empires, were finite, by claiming your library contained every book in the world, you could claim your empire controlled the world itself. The second motif is the transfer of books from place to place as people buy, steal, and plunder them. One especially common journey that fictional book collections take is from Athens to Alexandria to Rome. In these stories, the transfer of books symbolizes the transfer of power in the West, from Greece to Rome, from library to library, and from empire to empire. Myths and origin stories encode people's beliefs and shape their actions. They become part of our history, the way we understand our past 
and ourselves. But they can also create false narratives of continuity, narratives that empires can exploit to their own ends. Sometimes the result is that history is forgotten until all we have left is what we've imagined. Hellenistic libraries shaped ideas about Greece, both as institutions that promoted Greek literature and as symbols of cultural continuity. By studying libraries, we can better understand many of our own ideas about Greek literature, Greece, and the supposed origins of Western civilization. But by studying libraries, we can also better understand the world around us today. Data is money, knowledge is power, and the fantasy of the universal library is closer than ever. As technology changes what libraries are, we can best understand ideas about them by turning to libraries of the past, real and imagined. Thank you. From almost every building you enter, to every bridge you cross, to every car you drive, and even to every roller coaster you ride, you may have never noticed, but the world around us is filled with structures that are made of beams. These beams are the fundamental building block to many of today's modern engineering marvels. These structures are everywhere because they're strong, lightweight, inexpensive, and easy to build. The person attributed to this innovation is an influential architect named Ithiel Town, who in 1820 patented a revolutionary bridge design that changed the world of construction. His design, consisting of diagonals, was something no one had ever seen before. Although seemingly simple, this unintuitive design is still what underlies much of the built environment in which we live in today. For the past 200 years, Engineers have introduced small variants of the original design, marginally improving its functionality. As a mechanical engineer working with a team of biologists at the Wies Institute for Bioinspiring Engineering, we're looking at new ways to rethink these structures and to push our knowledge beyond the original design. We're breaking a habit of mind by seeking inspiration from a source that's been around for over 500 million years. That source is this humble deep sea glass sponge called the Venus flower basket. If we look closely into this living creature, we see that its glassy skeleton is composed of diagonals formed by two parallel beams going in each direction. Using image correlation technique and mathematics, we're able to extract the design interpretation from the sponge to better understand its potential significance. As part of my PhD dissertation, I used a combination of experiments, and computer simulations to understand how the sponge compares to other structures. Particularly, I compare these three designs, one that's inspired by the sponge, and two that are commonly found, found in modern architecture. To compare them fairly, I ensure that they all have the same weight and the same amount of material allocated to diagonals versus non-diagonals. For the experimental portion of the study, I took these designs and tessellated them to a three by three cell, extruded them to form a finite size structure. Using rapid prototyping technology, such as 3D printing and laser cutting, I was able to build realistic and precise models of these structures. Once they were built, I placed them in a mechanical compression device to see how they behave. As they're compressed, I was able to measure how much weight each structure could handle before they failed. In this chart, we can see the results of this experiment. The blue bar, which represents the sponge, has a 20% higher yielding strength than the other designs. That means that the sponge is at least 20% stronger than the other structures. Realistically, in infrastructure, we don't undergo loadings in only one direction. So we ask ourselves, how do these designs perform when loads are applied in different directions? To answer this question, and to save myself time having to create numerous experiments in the laboratory, I resort to computer simulations as a method to test these at all possible angles. The first measure I obtained from the model is the structural stiffness, 
This provides me with information of how flimsy or how rigid a particular structure is. In this graph, we see that all of the structures behave the same way as all of the lines run on top of each other. That means that all of the structures have the same stiffness, no matter what angle the load is applied. The second measure obtained from the model is the structural strength. As in the experiments, this provides us with information of how much weight each structure can carry before they fail. In this graph, every structure behaves very differently now, with a sponge, given by the blue line, upbeating all of the other structures for every possible loading angle. If we put these two information together, we can clearly see that the sponge provides a stronger structure without having to compromise anything or even having to add more material. But up until now, we've only considered a set number of structures that are based on observations from nature and existing architecture. And we ask ourselves, can we do better than the sponge? And is this design truly the best? To answer this question, I developed an optimization algorithm to survey the multidimensional design space and choose which set of parameters creates the strongest structure. In this algorithm, I allow the computer to decide where to place each set of diagonals, while at the same time solve for how much material should be allocated diagonals versus non-diagonals. But most importantly, I performed this analysis for increasing number of beams. The results of the optimization show that by having two diagonals, as the sponge does, we're able to achieve the strongest practical structure while still maintaining the symmetry found in nature. Therefore, using this new sponge-inspired design, engineers all over will be able to sustainably construct taller buildings and longer bridges without having to use additional resources. These results demonstrate the power of biomimicry and that we as humans are unbounded in thinking of a world of unexplored possibilities. And with that, I'd like to ask you to think about this. Can we look elsewhere in nature and around us for inspiration to solve problems we don't even know we have? Thank you. Four summers ago, when I was doing research in Shanghai, a curious thing kept happening to me. Whenever I held a ride on an app such as Uber or Didi, I would immediately get a call from the driver. Where are you? Ah, stay there, I'm coming. <laughs> Can he find me on the map? Eventually, I asked the driver to explain. He said he needed verbal confirmation because he often gets ghosted by customers. It turns out when traffic conditions are bad, many people abandon their orders. Some even held two rides on separate apps at once and take whichever rides come first. Drivers thus wade through traffic only to find their customers and fares have disappeared. So they decided to call the drivers, to call the users directly to remind them that behind the moving dots on the digital interface, there are real humans. Seeing only the technological and forgetting the human is not some byproduct of digital platforms. It is a feature of their design. On these platforms, individuals are treated as sets of data, which get processed by computational algorithms that make decisions on their behalf. For instance, when I place an order on a ride-hailing platform, the apps collect data such as my neighborhood of residence, place of work, tra past travel habits, and so on. These data, along with some of other users, are fed into algorithms to predict supply and demand and generate 
personalized fears. Say, if I live in a fancy neighborhood, I probably have to pay more. Once I hit order, I then get paired with a driver who must follow the app's planned route to pick me up and complete the trip. Through this whole process, neither he nor I are allowed to question how are we paired? How is the fare generated? The only decision we can make is whether or not to accept. Just like this, the platform inserts itself into our society as a powerful intermediary, reformatting our decision-making process and controlling the scope of our human agency. As an anthropologist who studies the relationship between humans and technology, I want to make sense of the trend and understand the effects it is having on our society. For the past five years, I've immersed myself in China's ride-hailing industry, in communities of computer engineers, corporate managers, and drivers to study how platform governance is created, institutionalized, and experienced in everyday life. Through my work, I learned that this trend is fundamentally being driven by moral values that prioritize efficiency and control over human agency. Many engineers think that humans are the weakest link in technological systems, a barrier to achieving frictionless transportation. Therefore, it is desirable to automate human decisions to the greatest possible extent with the ultimate aim of replacing human fleets with autonomous driving cars. Drivers, on the other hand, believe they are crucial parts of the system. They argue that it is their test and knowledge, communication skills, and creative problem solving that make the platform work in the real world. However, their contributions often go unseen and unrewarded. As the scope of human agency shrinks, what is lost is not just our jobs, but important parts of what makes us human. To explain what I mean, let me tell you about VTaxi, a grassroots community of taxi drivers who have done things differently. Founded in the city of Hangzhou, VTaxi created their own digital ride-sharing platform before the founding of Didi and the arrival of Uber in China. When I first encountered them during my fieldwork, I was immediately struck by the human-centric design of their platform. When a new driver enters the community, he is assigned to a close-knit team of eight to 10 drivers. During the apprenticeship, he learned from them the rules of the community and develops his professional skills until he reaches full member status. The driver then recruits and cultivates a personal pool of clients whose pre-booked trip generate the bulk of his income. But whenever he cannot fulfill order because of schedule conflict or anything, he can share freely with his peers on the VTaxi platform. He first posts the order to his team. If no one claims it, he then posts it to the entire community. Through these human algorithms, VTaxi matches drivers with clients efficiently while prioritizing social relations and individual agency. This community-based model has proven highly successful. Since its inception in 2012, drivers in over 80 cities in China have taken up this idea and created their own VTaxi communities. 
today. They even cooperate to form an intercity network that provides seamless service across China. In contrast to platforms such as Uber and Didi, which atomize service providers and control their behaviors, VTaxi encourage the formation of interpersonal bonds and long-term relations. Many drivers told me that after years of driving the same clients, they have developed a friendship that extended beyond the digital platform. The driver is the first person who gets called when the client parent gets sick and need a ride to the hospital, or when the client's cat needs feeding when they're away on a business trip. People produce technologies, but technologies also shapes what it means to be human. My research shows that there is an alternative way to imagine platforms. With more human-centric designs, platforms could empower local communities rather than centralizing them. They could help but build trust rather than inserting themselves as a universal mediator. They could enable us to make moral decisions rather than making the decisions for us. There is, I think, a better path forward. We can leverage the power of technology to make ourselves more human. Thank you. Imagine for a moment that you are biting into a slice of freshly baked apple pie. Except today, your nose is congested due to a cold. So you're disappointed to find that the pie has lost its normally delicious taste. But why is it that a congested nose changes the way foods taste? Well, it turns out that often when we think we are tasting something, we are actually perceiving its flavor. And flavor is the combined sensations of both taste and smell. The perception of flavor does not arise inside of our taste buds, nor inside of our nose. Rather, it is a creation of our brains. As a neuroscientist, I want to understand how our brains create our perception of reality, in particular, flavor perception. And I have dedicated my PhD work to exploring this question. But how can we even begin to understand flavor perception when our brains are comprised of nearly 100 billion brain cells, or neurons, that are tightly packed together and constantly communicating with each other using a language of electric impulses that we barely understand. Instead, we need to turn to the brain of an organism with only a minuscule fraction of the number of neurons in its brain compared to ours, yet that is still organized on the same basic principles as our brains. An organism in which we can use genetic tools that allow us to monitor and manipulate the activity of individual neurons so that we may understand how they create flavor. Enter the fruit fly larva. <laughs> I decided to turn to the larva for my research because not only do their tiny brains have many similarities to ours, but these creatures are also voracious eating machines. They are constantly using their senses of smell and taste to find the most nutritious region in their environment. But do they actually combine the senses of smell and taste to perceive flavor? Well, to find out, I developed an experimental approach in which I could measure flavor perception in the larvae 
based on their efficiency at navigating towards a potential food source. I placed larvae in the center of an arena and created a gradient from a low to a high concentration of either an attractive smell, an attractive taste, or the combination of the attractive smell and taste. And I recorded their behavior. I repeated these experiments many times until I had recorded the behavior of hundreds of larvae in each condition. What I found is that when only the smell or taste gradients were provided alone, the larvae would meander a lot, but eventually they would find their way to the highest concentration of either stimulus. When both the taste and smell gradients were placed together, the larval navigation nearly doubled compared to either stimulus alone. So these results suggest that somewhere in the larva's tiny brain, it's able to combine smell and taste to improve its navigation towards a potential food source. But how does its brain do this? To find out, I used a microscope setup in which I could peer into the pinpoint-sized brain of the larva that was placed in a device called a microfluidic chip, a small chamber with an array of channels. Using this setup, I could deliver various concentrations of smell and taste solutions into this chip, which was custom designed in our lab. Within the chip, the different stimuli would get mixed together and could be directed to flow past the larva's nose and mouth. At the same time, I could record the activity of neurons in its brain using fluorescent proteins that would glow brighter and brighter the more active the neurons became. Using genetic tools, I could target specific cells to see whether and how they respond to smells, tastes, or mixtures of the two. I spent many months in a dark room peering into a microscope and systematically recording the activity of different neurons in the larval brain in response to smells, tastes, and mixtures. I found several neurons that were located at the entryway of the brain that responded and changed in activity to both smells and tastes. Surprisingly, these neurons were right at the entryway in a region that we had previously thought only coded information about smells. So for the first time, these recordings indicate that these primarily smell-responsive neurons can also be modulated by tastes. Now, for a long time, neuroscience textbooks have indicated that smell and taste signals first travel separately before being combined deep within the brain to create flavor. But this classic textbook depiction may be incorrect. My results, as well as recent studies in mammals, instead suggest the idea that there is a lot more crosstalk at early stages of sensory processing than was previously thought. And this early convergence may not just be true for taste and smell, but also for sounds and sights, temperatures and smells, and taste and touch, just to name a few. So by studying the tiny brain of a fruit fly larva, we can learn valuable lessons about how the brain functions. And it's important that we understand how the brain functions so that we may potentially be able to repair it when it malfunctions. But there are still many unanswered questions. For example, how do internal states such as hunger, change flavor perception? How are flavors encoded as memories? And how do they motivate us to eat more, even when we may feel full? Ultimately, our experiences and our desires are a di direct result of the activity of neurons in our brains. Understanding where and how those realities are created within our brains may be the key to a better and more flavorful life. Thank you. Music is often called a universal language. 
But the truth is a bit more complicated. Let's say that a performer on the piano and the South Indian classical flute wish to play together. As soon as they start, they may encounter something we can call a musical language barrier. Their instruments are in different tunings. Tuning is the science that conceives, locates, and names pitches, the pitches used to make music, at points on the acoustical spectrum, extending from low to high frequencies, like the color spectrum, from dark to light. Each instrument is tuned differently according to local tradition and custom, meaning that the piano is tuned one way and the flute is tuned another. So when they play together, they will produce harmonies that are not in tune. Is there an answer to this problem? As a music theorist and concert pianist myself, I'm constantly looking for ways to better understand the science of musical tuning. And about four years ago, I stumbled upon a centuries-old trove of writing suggesting an unusual and surprising remedy, a universal tuning system, which, like the proposed international language, Esperanto, could be used to make cultural exchanges once thought impossible, possible. That system was called just intonation, and its proponents extended around the world, from England to Germany to India to Japan and to the rest of all of the continents, except Antarctica, of course. <laughs> For the past several years, I have been traveling around the world to locate their writings and archives and to find the instruments that they built in order to showcase the merits of their system. When I find these instruments, I assist in their reconstruction. And then I challenge myself to learn how to play them. And today I would like to share with you some of the results of what I found. But first, let's take a look at the science of tuning as it applies to the piano which has 12 different keys, each corresponding to the 12 different types of pitches used in Western classical music. And so if you are a tuner responsible for tuning the piano, you do so by listening to the gaps in between those pitches, which we call intervals. And there are three types of intervals that most have to be in tune. The octave, or the distance between eight white keys, the fifth, or the distance between five, and the third, the distance between three. So let's say that you decide to tune the instrument so that all fifths are perfectly in tune, all distances equivalent to five white keys on the instrument. Well, if you look at what you end up with, you'll find that actually the thirds and the octaves have gone slightly out of tune. So let's listen to how this would sound. First, we'll hear all of these intervals sounding simultaneously if they were tuned correctly. Listen to that smooth consonants. And now here it is, if the whole instrument is tuned, only pay attention to perfect fifths. It's subtle, but do you hear that vibration? Listen again to the original. We want something smoother like that. So let's try again. And now let's tune the instrument using only perfect thirds. Well, if we check again, we'll find the result is even worse. Let's listen again to how it should sound. And now how it sounds tuned by perfect thirds. Clearly that's no good, right? We want this. It turns out that unfortunately, there is simply no way to tune a collection of only 12 pitches so that all octaves, fifths, and thirds are perfectly in tune. And so it seems that we have to make a compromise in the size of those intervals. And we do this with a system called temperament, which consists of making small adjustments to the location of those pitches so that each of those intervals are different by such a small amount that we can hardly notice the error. The way that we accomplish a temperament might depend on the type of music. So if we need a lot of thirds, we might optimize those, sacrificing some of the consonants of the fifths or the other way around. But no temperament will produce a perfect harmony. And when you listen to the sound of tempered music, you'll hear a tremulous quality. 
let's hear what that sounds like. So not perfect, but for most musicians, it seems like this is the best you can do. But not for the just intonation theorists, who would accept nothing less perfect in that same piece that you heard than this. You hear how that tremulous sound is gone. Now we have clear, perfect consonants. So the just intonation theorists were able to accomplish this by a neat trick, by simply extending the number of pitches from 12 to all the way up to 53. And then they designed keyboards to make the system practical <laughs> with as many as 53 keys. These keyboards look crazy. And they're difficult to play, it's true, but not impossible, as I found when trying them myself. Actually, what you heard earlier was me playing this instrument, invented by an inventor from Japan after only two days of practice. It's more intuitive than you would think. Just intonation theorists were so confident in the results that they were able to accomplish that they preached for their system by likening it to the most radical social movements of the day, calling for the abolition of temperament as a way of drawing the world more literally together in perfect consonants. So what went wrong? Why don't we play these crazy looking keyboards now? Well, for one thing, they're impractical. <laughs> they're hard to mass produce also on a large scale. And a simpler system emerged as the lingua franca, so to speak. Equal temperament with only 12 notes per octave and so called because it locates each of those 12 pitches and equal points on the acoustical spectrum. Equal temperament as lingua franca answers the collaborative challenge that was posed at the beginning, but it comes at a cost. And this cost highlights the danger of looking for a universal system. The danger is actually not in terms of consonants, of course, because actually equal temperament is also not so bad. But in terms of two factors, which I'd like to close with today. The first is the issue of translation. If we accept the premise that each tuning system is like a language, then we can understand how translating a traditional song from one system into another, we are at risk of losing something of its essence, as when we translate a poem from one language to another. And then the other issue is the loss of tradition. As more and more musicians around the world adopt equal temperament, fewer use traditional tuning practices, creating a phenomenon of loss that we might liken to what linguists call language death. And so while we can appreciate the ingenuity of those who invented the just intonation system, the lesson might be that we can actually gain more from turning our energy away from developing a universal system and towards learning as many different languages, tuning systems, as we can. The richness of music comes from the fact that it is not a universal language, that musicians can speak in many different tunings, giving them a broader range of expression than any single universal system could ever accomplish. Thank you. Wow, just wow. Um, I'm, I'm furious with uh, the 2019 Harvard Horizon Scholars because you're an incredibly difficult act to follow. <laughs> so pity me, <laughs> you're amazing. Um, seriously, what a testimony to the power of understanding deeply and explaining simply and that to my mind is what we need throughout academia and that's what we're very much trying to foster throughout the GSAS and goodness knows we need it right through society. Huge congratulations. <laughs> um, 
And we're going, to, we're going to celebrate the 2019 Harvard Horizon Scholars as a group uh, in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to pause to um, acknowledge so many people um, who made this program, have made this program an incredible success over, over seven years. And uh, there are far too many to mention, but here's just a few. I want to acknowledge uh, Shaoli Meng and Hisa Kuriyama, who first proposed the idea and launched the program, the inventors of Harvard Horizons. <laughs> I want to acknowledge um, Stephen Blythe, PhD 92, and David Gotchman, AM 1990, uh, generous GSAS alumni who've made the last seven years possible. The faculty, the faculty fellows for their amazing guidance and mentoring of this year's scholars. And a huge, huge thanks to all the GSAS and Derek Box Center staff, without whom nothing, none of this. Hooray! <laughs> And it's last but absolutely not least, I have to mention two individuals. I have to mention Sheila Thomas from GSAS and Pamela Pollock from the Box Center. Um, all the work that uh, I've witnessed, a lot of it, but I know there's been just so much more. And I know the scholars are very, very aware of this. Um, from the beginning, very beginning of the program seven years ago, all that hard work. Um, has enabled our scholars to walk that tightrope. So huge thanks to them. So now, Harvard Horizons 2019 scholars, please join me as a group, because we want to celebrate you. And finally, as our scholars leave the stage, please join me and the scholars uh, for a reception outside in the transept. Uh, can't wait to see you and talk more then. Thank you.